Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're talking about uh, it being a brand new France since January the 1st, what with the introduction of a law that uh, allows employees the right to disconnect from their jobs after hours. Easier said than done when your smartphone is at hand. Uh, with us to talk about it, Rav Harfouche, founder of Red, the Red Thread Institute for Digital uh, Culture. Uh, your upcoming book, Hustle and Float, what, what, what's, the, what's the book about? The book is about the fundamental tensions that we're seeing between productivity models and creativity models and how they apply to modern work in a knowledge economy. An irresistible force against an unmovable object? I think an opportunity to change a little bit and, uh, you know, stop trying to compare ourselves to machines and assembly lines, so. All right, well, Fabrice Pelboy in part one uh, vowed to change a little bit when he talked about his work <laughs> habits. Uh, he's with the uh, French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Welcome back. I want to welcome back as well uh, journalist Emmanuel Leneuf, the founder of Flash Tweet, and uh, Emma France, co-founder of the Education Lab. Uh, welcome to, back to all of you. Lots of reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. We need a right to disconnect here in the U.S. too. So many <laughs> employers expect you to work on vacation, exclamation point. Uh, uh, well, if you have $570 and three days to spare, <laughs> there's always Camp Grounded. It's a summer camp-like retreat for grown-ups run by a company called Digital Detox. I say like it, it's like a summer camp. It is a summer camp. It's three days, three days long. It, would that be money well spent? Do you think uh, five hundred and seventy dollars uh, to learn how to unplug? I mean, I think if you have the money and the time, sure, why not? I think the bigger message here is that people are starting to look for ways to forcibly disconnect. And yes, we all know where the off button is, and we all know that we should turn off our phones, but it's clear with the rise of these events that we might need a little bit of help. So going to an event like this, like an actual detox from some of the addictions that we have with our devices, could be just what you need to reset your perspective in order for you to reprioritize how you want to spend your time. Is it so, an addiction in the, in the same way that, you know, smoking or drinking is an, or gambling is an addiction? Yes, I, I believe so. We're starting to see some research come out now that says that we're training ourselves the way Pavlov trained dogs, that when our phones ding and we get notification that our brain releases endorphins, we are training ourselves to crave the constant interaction with our devices. And sometimes the only way to break that is to take yourself on a long plane ride or um, <laughs> if for you to maybe take a couple of days. I will just say that um, you don't have to go away, that there are lots of practices you can start doing it, you know, in your home. There's a very big community of people that do the digital Sabbath, as it's called, which is they disconnect for one day a week on the weekend. So you can do it you know, on a micro level um, as well. But I do think it's, it's, a, it's a cry for um, at least a change. Uh, Emmanuel Luneuf, when your battery goes dead on your phone, <laughs> um, are you relieved no, or are I'm, you anguished? I'm, I'm like driving crazy, you know, <laughs> like everybody. Oh, oh, you, it drives you crazy yeah. when you no longer have battery. Yeah, I can't stand it. I'm, Fabrice, I'm on my followers. It's you feel same. the same way? No, I got used to it. It happens. It's <laughs> like that. It's not a major big deal. You can live with that. Emma? Yeah, I can live with that too. My relatives cannot, and that's their problem. Often they tell me, they tell me uh, that uh, my, my phone was discharged and that they couldn't reach me. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but... And uh, no, it, it's okay for me. I mean, yes, we need to be connected and reachable at all times. And this is maybe the thing that is kind of... Um, we, we need to, to find a balance. And um, as we were talking about camps, I think one of... Another trend uh, is very interesting towards this kind of uh, addiction. It's um, all the, uh, the, the trend around yoga and meditation. Ten years ago, it would have seen, seemed bizarre to do these kind of things. And now, especially in um, urban areas, in cities, people, and um, especially young people in their 30s, are becoming to uh, do that. And this is only a way to reconnect to themselves and to be more focused on a moment. And this is why it's called mindfulness, 
and uh, all these things. I'm not an expert, but I see this trend as really the other uh, thing towards um, to equilibrate, to find a balance towards this work ethics that can be really uh, addictive sometimes. Addictive to the point where you have to wonder, Fabrice Pelbois, are, are human beings being altered by all of this? Oh, definitely, yes. I, I totally agree with the point. Yoga is a, and meditation is a great way to counterbalance digital addiction. Uh, but yes, of course, those devices are changing ourselves on, on a brain level. They are definitely changing ourselves. We are addicted to something totally artificial. And we have to be aware that this is changing the way we react to events, the way we emotionally and collectively react to events, uh, the way we um, lived collectively. Uh, the terror attacks in France, for example, has been totally altered and totally mastered by social media because there was a collective experience totally new. We used to have those collective experience from a top-down relationship to media. Uh, we have now a nearly decentralized collective experience, which is really new. And those tools are really changing society and human beings by themselves. You talk about the word emotion. Mm -hmm. Are emotions running higher now? I don't know if they're running higher or lower, but differently, that's for sure. Emmanuel, your thoughts on this? Uh, I just wanted to, to, to add something on, on what said Emma. That mindfulness trend is also in companies. And when you go to events, you know, big events uh, around digital, you have like a session uh, on mindfulness. And everybody is like... Uh, you know, a bit like the tent at the rock concert in the 60s where you would yeah, come down from yeah. an LSD trip? Yeah, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> I don't know, I, I wasn't there, but more or less like that. So, no, I just I wanted to, to say that it's, uh, you know, a preoccupation. Look people today. We used to uh, look, uh, have uh, the information on TV that some celebrity is dead, and that was something very personal to our relationship to a celebrity. Today, it's a collective thing. Everybody is mourning with everybody on Twitter, especially on Twitter, and it really changed the emotional aspect of mourning a celebrity. Which brings us to the heart of the, the matter, which is, do we really want to disconnect? Ubiquitous online retailer Amazon is pushing something it calls Alexa, a smart device you could keep in your home and it's only the beginning, You'll if you uh, believe the folks preparing for the annual for Consumer me? Electronics Show, which it's opens Friday Amazon in Echo. Las Vegas. How's it going? Uh, I'm just finishing The smart up home right trend is going to be huge this year. I think a lot of people, companies big and small, are going to be talking about how they can make their life easier with the smarter light bulb or the smarter washing machine, smarter refrigerator. You saw inklings of that the last couple of shows. But I think uh, smart home and connected devices are going to be a huge deal at this show. Raf Harfouche, is this what everyone's going to be talking about at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, the smart home, and is that a good thing? I think, I think that the, the main issue that I see here is that the technology is moving so much faster than our ability to assess the, the implications of it on our lives. Uh, do I want a dishwasher that automatically knows when to run to minimize my energy bill? Great. Yes. Do I want a television that's going to listen to what I say and then record it and send it to third, you know, third parties? No, I don't. So I think the bigger conversation isn't that is it a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's about figuring out what spaces we're willing to share with our technology and then to what extent. But people are happily signing on to buy these mm -hmm. products that put, well, spying devices, as you say, in their homes. Why are they happily signing on? Because they're stupid. <laughs> but basically, we, we know how to assess the risk. Uh, we had uh, several major websites, uh, US major websites, disconnected from an attack made by Internet of Things. A little video camera you buy for $20 at the local supermarket. And uh, we know that the NSA is using those but, things. Wait a minute, to I've, spoken to, I've spoken to people and they say, we don't care, we got nothing Oh, they don't care, they don't, there's no They're risk They're not for them. stupid, I'm not stupid, they're saying, I, don't, I just don't care. Well, too bad for them. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this, Emma? I mean, um, I think that uh, there are some technologies that um, are very interesting, but may not work in an economic sense because it it has to come from a need um i mean this is if it is like um 
not answering the needs of customers, it won't work anyway. So this is very important to have this in mind. So the jury's still out as to whether or not yeah, these smart homes will take off. And many, peop many articles were also saying, this is the end of gadgets, and we have many gadgets at uh, the CES, CES in Las Vegas. What is the point? Is it really doing to? Um, is it really happening? And uh, I haven't seen much, many, so many people wearing uh, iWatch, for instance. And it was, I don't know. I'm not sure that every technologies we see right now will um, invade the world. This is the first thing, and then um, I, I think. This, is, this has to, be, to come from need. And another need that we forget along the way is that the need for a social bond. And people, and there are a lot of initiatives coming uh, and a lot of events, physical events within cities, bringing people together. And I think that people have this um, feeling growing that they need to connect uh, in a meaningful way with people. So um, I'm not sure we're going to be plugged and that's it. Because, because there again, there's a contradiction, right? On the one hand, you're saying people have this craving to get together real human beings, to be in yeah. the moment, right? To, as, as, to use the phrase that everyone's using. But at the same time, all the talk of virtual reality and people can do so much now in front of their, their computer that they don't even need to, to step outside of their bedroom door. Yeah, but I think it is, you know, this paradox with human beings. Um, I mean, basically, it is as uh, it was said in the, um, the the review, the interview, and it was said we want to make people's life easier. So everything has to be easier for everyone. But at some point, if everyone's every everything is easy, it's annoying, and we get bored. So you have to keep things, and I would I think people will keep things that they do that are not optimized and uh, where you um, this is kind of a pretext for instance I could I could uh, order um, a meal on delivery or, or whatever platform but I could also cook with my roommates and the experience will not be the same and I think this kind of thing that um, some firms also uh, sell experience that are not always managing your time and optimizing everything is very is a very in, uh, important trend in society today raf harfouche you agree on that that uh, that actually perhaps we're you're saying about the technology being uh, faster than the humans thinking about it but uh, people are not ready to sign off necessarily on things like the smart home or the I, dumb home, depending on how you see it. Uh, I mean, here's, I don't think that people are dumb. I, I think, what I what I think is that the, the oftentimes we're optimistic and we tend to look at the benefits, especially when they're marketed to us in such a way where it is saying, this will make your lives easier, this will make your life better, this will help you be fitter. I mean, ultimately the human need that is being met is that we will help you, you know, live the life that you want to live, right? The question then becomes that there is many ways that I'm sure Fabrice can educate all of us on in terms of how these technologies can be used in very dangerous ways, but I would, I would maybe the average citizen isn't concerned about you know global information warfare or security or all of these things. And I'm actually think, saying that we should be. I think we should be more informed and we should be reading the fine print of the technology that we're using instead of what I'm sure a lot of people do when you get an update on your you know iTunes. Do you accept these terms and conditions? How many of us even read them? You I'm just click, yeah. pretty sure Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin is, are both going to teach all of us how dangerous those technology are and our collective uh, feeling about technology is going to change really, really uh, enormously. You think there'll be the a backlash? Years. Oh, definitely. How definitely. will that backlash manifest itself? Well, first of all, uh, we're using everywhere American technology that is also a spying device for the uh, USA. Uh, the USA, as you all noticed, uh, shifted dramatically in terms of geopolitics recently, and this is going to have a huge impact on the world. Um, one technology that really was instrumental in having Donald Trump as a president now uh, was about spying on, massive spying on people. Um, Tomorrow, those technologies are going to be available. They are actually available Hang on. in you, France. Explain that to me. You're saying that basically, how polling, did Donald Trump get elected? Polling thanks is to not spying? working anymore. Uh, polling is broken. There's no way you can pull opinion anymore in a traditional method. The way you can pull opinion today is by using mass surveillance and certain 
kind of technology like Palantir uh, that had been has been instrumental in having Donald Trump as a president. But we, is there evidence of this? Yeah, definitely, uh, the Mr. Digital, the the digital guy next to Donald Trump is Peter Thiel. That's the founder of Palantir. There are more than evidence. Uh, <laughs> Those technologies are now used uh, to, uh, for domestic spying in France. So this kind of polling will be available soon to uh, French politicians who, um, let's say, have a coalition with either Vladimir Putin or most more likely uh, Donald Trump, which basically is, let's say, Le Pen in France. Uh, so people trust me, are going to be aware that there is a dark side to technology, and this dark side is going to have a heavy load on the destiny of our country. And right. speaking about France. Francois, here. from from like a consumer perspective, we're also seeing the rise of the need for products for people to protect their privacy better. There are um, services now that you can merge with your Facebook profile that scrambles your information. We're seeing the rise of hoodies and hats and makeup that disrupt face scanners so that Facebook mm -hmm. can't recognize your pictures and things like that. So we're starting to see the emergence of a market where people are becoming a bit more aware of the surveillance that's happening and trying to figure out how to navigate their way through it. Emmanuel Leneuf, is this something that you've witnessed? I mean, we're, we're now in an election campaign, right, in this country. Only five months to go. Is this something that people are, yeah, are, yeah. are aware of, are yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah, I disagree with uh, yeah, the point because, uh, you know, my readers, all my followers, they are really, really um, uh, concerned by this point, uh, all this this uh, policy uh, um, on, uh, on, priv on privacy and uh, very, uh, you know, also big data, how the data is used. So it's, it's a major concern um, for people that are connected, I agree. But uh, I think that there's a, lot, um, a trend uh, toward this, um, you know, more, more privacy and how to protect from, uh, from being, uh, you know, spied or, but anyway, as we said, how can, what can we do? Am I, am I going to switch off because my data maybe uh, are going to be used by someone? I don't know. You know, it's, it's like uh, you've got to 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 move um, and and go further because you 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 you, you cannot um, check everything. Uh, Emma France, do you share Emmanuel Leneuf's fatalism about this? Um, I mean, I, th I think that there, there is still a lot of education uh, to be done in France and in other countries around this, this issue of uh, data privacy, because people are not always aware um, of all the data they are generating when they are surfing on the internet and who sees what. And um, for instance, um, they're not, um, many people are not aware that the, the choice they make um, for uh, um, if it's Google or Firefox they use to make a research, for instance, uh, for Chrome or Firefox, I mean, um, it's a different because the, the conditions of use are different and nobody reads that. And I think this is really a pity, and it, it should actually be taught at school. It should be, you should, we should help um, children who are more connected than anyone else to get into this. Right, because I was going to ask you, you, you're, you, a lot of your work focuses on education, and we always have the sense that young people are ahead of the curve, that they understand this stuff a lot better than older ones. Mm. Is that your experience? I would not say that they understand it, they use it. Mm. This is different, yeah. and it triggers behaviors and way of thinking, way of behaving with others. Um, there has been in the schools, for instance, a very sad um, events, which was uh, social networks harassment, which is- Cyberbullying. Exactly. And this is really a very bad use of social networks and how you can hide behind it. And um, I'm not sure they're all aware of how all the data they're creating. And for instance, I've used Facebook from when I was in high school. And now I'm reflecting on this use and I'm just um, being aware, getting aware that all the photos I'm uploaded on Facebook do not belong to me anymore once they're uploaded. And this is something that is written down somewhere in the website, but I haven't re read it when I got, when I uh, mm. uh, subscribed, you know? So this is something we need to 
educate people, but it is the same for the law. We need to educate people to read the law they're um, under. To read the privacy settings. Exactly. Oh dear, could be a long night if I start to do <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Emma, I want to thank you. I want to thank Raph, Arfouche, Emmanuel Leneuf, Fabrice Appelboin. Stay with us because our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to uh, James Creighton, who has the right to connect. Indeed, I do, <laughs> for now. I'm still, still on office hours. Uh, well, the law, Francois, has generated headlines uh, in media around the world. Uh, this is the Sydney Morning Herald. French employees can legally ignore work emails outside of office hours. A lot of tech websites, too. I'm not sure we saw the, the Sydney Morning Herald uh, headline, but it, it is also on tech websites. France gives you the legal permission to avoid work email. So it's really captivating, I think, the imagination yeah, did of you, people Did you the see, world. by the way, on the hashtag F24 debate, I didn't read this one from one viewer, can the right to disconnect be worldwide? I know, I think people, <laughs> a lot of people really want it because people realise that increasingly there is this pressure to be uh, connectable or connect, uh, contactable 24 hours a day and we're not machines, we're human beings, we need to rest. So I think everybody is, is, uh, is, is uh, at least in some way affected uh, by uh, by these issues. Now, one quote in this article by Benoit Hamon, socialist uh, uh, MP and presidential hopeful potentially, said when, when the law was first being discussed earlier in 2016, employees physically leave the office, but they do not leave their work. They remain attached by a kind of electronic leash like a dog. Uh, emails colonize their life uh, to the, uh, the, the life of the individual to the point where he or she eventually breaks down. He also mentioned uh, social media and other forms of messages in that quote. Uh, so just to show you some uh, social uh, network uh, applause for this move in France, Occupy Wall Street. We know where they're positioned uh, politically. More awesomeness from France. <laughs> uh, workers win legal right to avoid checking work email. Uh, so uh, a thumbs up from uh, Occupy <laughs> Wall Street. Uh, meanwhile, Josh Kruger also uh, very impressed by worker protections in uh, laws in France. France, years after instituting a 35-hour working week, which remains, of course, very controversial, now uh, a legal mandate, uh, legally mandate it's uh, a right to no work email at home rule. Just one further uh, social media uh, remark. Global markets, digital devices, social media have created round-the-clock expectations. Actually, we have more. Uh, and this is in response to a, a discussion on social media about the topic. Uh, constant flow. It's not realistic with my work to think I can just look at email at prescribed times of the day. So that's the counter argument that it's just not realistic in the current uh, global work environment to plug out when there's an urgent issue that needs to be dealt with. But this advice, th these are articles, by the way, Francois, that don't date from uh, this particular uh, law. That's an article from 2014. But when I started Googling it and searching for reaction, I came across lots of other articles because this debate keeps coming back. Uh, the advice that people should plug out at a certain point in the evening to be more efficient the following morning, even just to sleep better. Because, of course, if you're on your phone all, all evening, you might go to bed later. Raf Harfouche, that is so essential, isn't it? The, 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 the urge to check uh, your messages is one thing, but the urge to respond mm. is perhaps uh, something even worse. There's a phenomenon, an actual sociological phenomenon called work devotion, by which what that means is that we as social creatures have trained each other to give each other signals that we deserve to be at our job. And those signals are communicated through acts of struggle or, um, you know, shows of strength. So I stayed up all night. I'm so busy. My inbox is out of control. All of those things are verbal triggers that fall under this idea of work devotion. And with the last tweet that you showed with the lady who said, well, you know, basically what she's saying is that her job is so important that of course she needs to be able to respond. And this is some of the underlying cultural impacts of the way that we work, is that we think it's a matter of ego, it's, it's a matter of importance. Busyness has actually become a way that we show the world how much we are valued by society. And this is one of the things that a lot of people are gonna struggle with when they have to disconnect. There's even, as just on that point, in, in Japan, there's even a term for death by overwork. I think it's Kiyoshi, but I might be... Karashi. Karashi, that's it. And so, I mean, that's, if you take it to the nth degree, that's where it goes, I guess. And that's very much bound up with work emails, social media, being constantly plugged in. Uh, what other uh, responses do we have or issues or articles related to it? Why you should do your work first and others work mm -hmm. second. Now, the previous article was saying plug out at the end of the day. Uh, this is saying 
don't check your email at the start of the day. In fact, you should be looking at your long-term goals for the first couple of hours. I suppose this is particularly for people who have nine to five, nine to six office jobs where uh, they could get stuck into email at the start of the day and then get bogged down in what other people are asking of them instead of actually taking care of their long-term goals or more strategic personal uh, goals that are related to work. So there is uh, some advice here that people shouldn't check their email for the first couple of hours of the day. All right, hold off on checking that email. It's James nice. Creedon, I want to thank you. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.